What a day, what a day, what a great day. Long drive, been up since 3 a.m., had 150 mile drive, loved it. It was kind of cool to hang out with God and see no snow on the ground, which was really cool. You know, being from California, snow and me don't go very well together. But it looks good. It looks nice. I get cold real easy, though, guys. So it's, it's really, uh, it's a blessing. It's a blessing to be in this part of the world. Hey, um, I wanted to share with you guys something that, that the Lord had laid on my heart. And I, I hadn't been around here in many, many, many years. Um, went through a lot of stuff, a lot of changes. Used to pastor up at Calvary Chapel, Beckley. Um, I don't remember how long it's been since I've been there. But God took me down a different path. And... Um, and during that time change, a lot of other things has changed as well. And so I stopped by here about four months ago unexpectedly. One day the Lord just laid on my heart to come back and visit. And Bill and I sat in the office for hours and I shared some of the things that have been going on. And he says, you need to write a book. And, uh, and so I thought, yeah, well, maybe you're right. But he said, will you share that message with my body, with my church? And I thought, well, yeah, I guess I can do that. It would be kind of kind of personal a little bit and kind of tough because it's a lot of, a lot of emotion behind it, but I'd be more than happy to do that. So that's kind of the, the emphasis I'm coming from today, to be able to share my heart with you, the things God's taught me in the last several years, um, the last three or so especially, uh, which really starts about 17 ago or 18 ago, but uh, the last three are the most pertinent. So I'm gonna kind of break this message up into a combination of something I normally wouldn't do, some Bible texts, story, Bible text, story, Bible text, story, to kind of give some impact to uh, exactly what, what the scripture is saying. And hopefully you guys can really learn and glean something from this because, because quite honestly, um, in the last several years, God's taught me about what Jesus, what it was like for him to be a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And he's also taught me how despite in spite of what we go through in life, no matter how many hard things we deal with, just like Christ, no matter how much suffering he did on this planet, he still loved and he still continued to love. And that he takes no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. And these are some of the lessons that he has taught me through personal experience, that although my life has changed tremendously, and gotten very difficult in many ways, those people who have hurt me the most, they've never stopped being loved. And I think that's the message that God wants us to talk about today and share today. And it's really my passion to be able to pour that into you and to make a difference and have an impact in your life. So Father, I wanna come before your throne. I wanna ask, Lord, that you would go before this time. Father, I wanna ask that you would minister to your people I want to ask, Lord, that you would empower me to share what you want me to share and only what you want me to share. Not of myself, not of my own feelings or, or anything I could make up in my brain. I don't want that at all. Father, I want to speak with boldness, but yet I want to be humble to allow you to, to do the work that you want to do in the lives of your people today. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. I wrote this story yesterday as I gave a lot of thought to this and I'm just kind of basically entitled it, you know, a tale of three women and one man. And this is a story about some people that, that I've heard about, that I've come across, that I know a little bit about and how it ties in with the scripture. So my text today, for instance, is gonna, or be a, is gonna start with the parable of the sower, okay? <clears throat> On the same day, this is in Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. On the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. And great multitudes were gathered together to him, so that he got into a boat and he sat. And the whole multitude stood on the shore. <clears throat> then he spoke many things to them in parables, parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell in on the stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root in them, they withered away. And some fell among the, thorn the thorns, 
And the thorns sprang up and choked them, and others fell on good ground, and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. <clears throat> Girl number one, and I'm going to read this to you as I wrote it, rather than just talk it from memory, um, even though I could do that. There was a man of great influence. He had it made. He had a, a, a great position in life. He came from an affluent family, lived in, ni a nice, uh, in a nice neighborhood, um, in nice neighborhoods. Great, he, was, um, he had a great career, and he knew all the right people. But one day he felt called to a faraway land with the intention to love and serve the people. It was, it was a hard place, very religious, not a whole lot of Jesus in that religion. He suffered much, but then one day he met a girl. She was lovely, but needed work. So his family offered her a job. He asked her what her aspirations in life were, what life were and in a joking way. He said, so what do you want to be when you grow up? Now keep in mind, this woman was probably close to 40 years old. <laughs> um, she responded, I always wanted to be a princess, but then one day I realized my knight in shining armor would never come. And so I've done anything I could my whole life to survive. The man's heart melted with such uh, an honest answer, and instantly he, he cared for her. Over time, they became friends. He learned of her life, which was filled with much pain. She came to America many years earlier to escape the drug cartels, and from being sold into it by, by sex traffickers. But not having any support in the, in the United States, uh, she came with little to no help and found herself in need. She met a man who eventually took her in. They married, and for two years, she had it really good. But afterwards, for many years, for the next following many years, he abused her tremendously until one day um, she took their children and left. She ultimately ended up in a shelter for quite a while, but eventually, uh, <clears throat> but eventually she lost her kids to her ex. From then on, she spent her life addicted to sex for survival and has been residing with a man not unlike the ones she fled to America to escape. The man was broken over her story, not a way anyone should be forced to live. As he got to know her, he, he shared Christ's love with her, Numerous times she said she believed, but due to the years of bad theology and bad compromised Christian witness, it all went away. Uh, i got to pick this up. I'm sorry, guys. I don't see very well anymore, and so um, it all went away. She suffered many health problems, but physically and emotionally, uh, both physically and emotionally from her lifestyle. She's had several surgeries and personally lives as a slave in poverty and is trapped in sin. As much as she feels like a caged lion, she refuses to leave the cage even though God opened that door. Despite her circumstances, she asked about her, what Jesus was like. She was told the kingdom was like a wealthy man who came to the poor and broken like her to save her and to love her and to bestow unto her all he owned. Jesus was like that prince she had always dreamt of. He wanted her to know her value, yet because she had a form of godliness, she, she thought she was safe, but she really wasn't. He made one final attempt a year later after fear and panic took over her life. You have to come to Jesus, he said. You can trust him. The man went to take her away from the evil she lived in, but she refused in fear, stating, I'm not giving up my life for you or any other person. Over time, the man lost touch with her, and because she would not turn from her sin, she completely rejected him. Now, this is a true story, guys, and, and this, is, this is something that came to me in it. I, it breaks my heart for her because she's quite a lovely person. You know, she's somebody who really wants to do the right thing. And she's pre been presented the gospel numerous times over the last 20 years. 
But in that time, she thought she was right because she had a Catholic background. See, she thought at one point, as she went and participated in all kinds of wild orgies and sex parties, that God, if you will just bring me one man to love me, then I'll, then I'll follow you. But the one man that came wasn't a man from God. He was a, another sex trafficker. And he came and he made her his personal slave. And she's been living with him for over 10 years. And she lives in a bedroom and she's trapped in one room. She doesn't leave that room, but she thinks she's okay because she's afraid that if she trusts God, if she leaves and gets out of the environment she's in, she will never, ever, ever have anything again. And at least he gives her nice clothes and a car to drive and a cell phone. And so she can go to work and do what she does. But she's got to be home at 9 o'clock at night. She can't leave at, after that point. And then she, he has her way with her at nighttime. That's, that's a slave. That's somebody who escaped trafficking when she came over here only to become trafficked, you know, 10 years later and has been let that way for another additional 10 years. And that's what she's become. And see, her heart is so hard because of the pain. Even though Christ has reached out to her and tried over and over and over again to penetrate her heart, she thinks she's okay. She thinks beyond a shadow of a doubt that she's going to heaven and she won't break free. No matter how many times people have shared with her, no matter how many times she's been asked to go to church, she just doesn't give in. As a matter of fact, she generally makes excuses when she says, oh, I'll, sh I'll meet you in church, and then turns and never shows up. And then makes up all kinds of stories and reasons why she didn't go to hear the word of God. And it's a very sad place to be because it says here, you know, in Matthew chapter 13, verse 19, when anyone hears the translation from Christ himself, the word of the kingdom, and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away that was sown in his heart. This is he who received seed by the wayside. See, the devil comes, guys, and will try to take away what God wants to plant. And that's what happened. This particular woman has no understanding of the word of God, no matter how many times it was explained to her in so many different ways to give her understanding. And even the one thing about her knight in shining armor or her prince charming, she wants the prince, but she doesn't perceive that Jesus truly is that prince. She doesn't get it. She doesn't see that she's loved so much and she's cared for so much and that very kingdom that she desires is right in her lap if she would just take it. You know, but she's in a pit. She won't get out of that pit. And as God reaches down, she won't take hold of his hand. And it just takes that step of faith. But the enemy came in and ripped that away from her. And quite honestly, when that man went and said, come on, let me help you. Let me get you out of the house. Let me take you to a place and set you up in your own home. Let me get the body of Christ to come alongside of you. The thing is she wouldn't do it because she felt like a caged lion like I read. But the bottom line is she wouldn't leave the cage. The door was wide open. And eventually it's going to close if you've, you know, seen the, that one movie, what was it, War Room or something like that, or one of those movies that, you know, that the old lady was talking to her son and she talked about the cage being closed forever and never being able to get out. And that's the circumstances that this woman's in. And see, God loves her so much, all he wants to do is say, come on, come on, come out. Take my hand. I'm going to take care of you. I'll send people to, to help you get on your feet. We'll get you free. But sometimes, guys, we get to a place in our lives where we're so used to living in the junk, we don't want to be free. We're so used to being bound up. And even sometimes, guys, as Christians, God wants us to live free and be who he's created us to be. But the bottom line is sometimes we just want to stay trapped, stay trapped in legal, legalism or rules. You know, cultures teach us we have to be a certain way. But God tells us that he made you. I think John read the verse earlier. 
is for freedom that Christ has set us free. No longer subject yourself to another yoke of slavery. God doesn't want us to be slaves. He didn't design us to be slaves. For this woman who's not a Christian or for the Christian who can't seem to get out of the trap, God does not want us to be enslaved to any yoke of anything. He, does, he died so we could be the exact person that he wants you and I to be. Girl number two. This young girl was abandoned by her natural father at a year old. She was raised and she was adopted by another. She was raised in the Lord. She was raised in a good home. She was raised in a nice neighborhood. You know, um, she was taught the Bible since she was three years old. She was brought up in the church. Daily devotions all the time. Fed the word of God. At a very young age, made a profession of faith. Her, her pastor father baptized her himself. You know, this young girl was walking with God and doing really well, but she had one problem. She had some learning issues. She had a learning disability. See, although she was adopted in the family, she had a disability, guys, that kind of really hurt her in school. And as a result, she was made fun of all the time. And no matter how much her parents poured the word of God into her, you know, and, and told her, that, hey, we can get through this. You can get through this. She kept moving and going to school, to, you know, and, and she would get not only abused by the children, but the teachers as well made fun, made fun of her. And it got to a point in her life where she was so afraid to go to school that she would spend the nighttime vomiting, afraid to get up to go in the morning. She would throw up because she was so afraid. And here's somebody that no matter how much you poured the word of God into her, you know, and no, much, no matter how much you loved her, you know, she still went through a lot of suffering, even to the point when she would go to the church and the church saw her as somebody different. And she even sometimes got abused by the pastor's wife, to be completely honest with you. And it was very difficult. And she started to become disheartened. But as her parents told her, we're sorry, we're sorry, Let, you know, she would just say all the time, hey, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Guys, it, it wasn't okay. Because God made that little girl in his image. He made her in his image. No matter what she's like or isn't like, God has given her gifts that she can use in her world to minister to those that he wants her to share the gospel with and to love in her own way. She's highly intelligent. She just has a very low cognitive ability to put pieces of a puzzle together. But she's brilliant when it comes to computers. She's brilliant when it comes to manipulation now. God made her the way he made her for a reason. And he'll use her because he loves her. But see, that little girl went through a lot of stuff. And she went through a lot of heartache and she suffered rejection everywhere from her natural father to the church, to the schools, everywhere. And no matter how much she said it's okay, that she'll be okay, that little girl today is living in poverty near homelessness. She's a single mom living with a bunch of reprobate drug addicts who won't even talk to her parents, who won't go to church, who won't do anything. And why did this happen? Well, she started pulling away little by little. You know, she was taken out of school and homeschooled after the fifth grade, you know. But because she was homeschooled, she really didn't have the interaction with other kids. And eventually when she did meet other kids at the homeschool co-op, they taught her about how to use the internet and do things she shouldn't do. And eventually she started pulling away more and more and more. And when she pulled away, the enemy came in and got some foothold and, and then this little girl ends up, you know, getting violated at a very young age running away from home, never finishing high school, lost the scholarship that she had, and her whole world went downhill really fast in the last four or five years. 
And everything that she thought was this fantasy on how she wanted to be free only bound her up. So why, where is this going? The next part of the scripture, verse 20, 21 in Matthew 13. He who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. And when tribulation and persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. See, this young girl, you know, believed in the things that her parents taught her about the Bible. She believed in what her grandparents taught her about the Bible. She believed in what she heard in church. Like I mentioned earlier, there was always family devotions going on. But see, guys, when things got really hard and she couldn't take it anymore and it didn't seem like Jesus worked for her, you know, she took a different path, a path that's led to destruction. Well, the bottom line is, it's like, did that, the question I would ask is, did that seed ever take root to start with? Because according to this text, it probably never did. Did she have expectations that maybe, just maybe, weren't met? And when she thought that, oh, life is going to be grand because I'm a Christian and we go to church and it seems to be one way and there's a lot of love and joy and... But when the hard times come, what happens? Are we going to stick in it with God? Are we going to hang fast? Are we going to batten down the hatches and move forward? Or did that root ever never take place and it was impossible for it to stay? You know, to stay. Because, the, you know, the storms came, the heat came, it scorched it. It got hard. See, guys, the Christian life we're seeing a change in the world right now. You know, when I got saved 40 years ago, it was kind of like American dream theology, right? Hey, man, I could have health and wealth and three more wishes. Come to Jesus and everything's good. I got saved at the end of the hippie era. You know, all the, all the flower children, all the free love stuff was going on. And guess what happens? You know, Everything was going great for a while at the end of the, in, the, in, in the early Calvary Chapel days. I like this Calvary Chapel. I'm going to add a side note. You know why? Because pastors Bill and John are very much old school, simple, teach the word of God, love the people Calvary Chapel. But in, and I love coming here because you guys are genuine. I, I haven't been here in I don't know how many years, seven, eight, nine years up until the last few months. And in that time, the people from this fellowship didn't treat me any differently than they did 15 years ago. There's a consistency in you guys that I love because although you may have a drawl like I don't, you know, the thing is, I live in a place where Southern hospitality is great until you turn your back. But here there's a genuineness that I've always felt and I've always loved in this fellowship. And the people here of this part of West Virginia have always been a blessing to me. And you guys are special. You're more special than you'll ever know. And don't ever forget that. When the enemy comes in and tries to rip you off and tell you that you're something you're not, just remember, God loves you and you are important to him. You're so important. I know you've heard it. He, uh, he died for you. Right, I get it. But it's more than just that. He wants to spend every waking moment with you. He wants to be with you through every area of your life, no matter what you go through. And as times change in this world, things are going to get harder. You know, we're, we're promised to suffer. Read First Peter. Sufferings are part of the Christian walk. And so... Based on that one thing, where are you? Where are we? Where am I? When the suffering hits, am I going to stick with it and keep walking with Jesus? Or am I going to turn and walk away? I'll tell you something. After 40 years driving up here today, I'm thinking, God, I'm done. This is hard. 40 years of hardship. I said, I thought I was going to be living on the beach driving a Ferrari or something. I'm not. I'm living up in Upper East Tennessee. I'm not a mountain guy. It's hard. It's hard because I'm different than the culture God has me living in. 
But it's okay. It's okay because he gets me through and he'll get us all through as we just keep clinging to him and walking with him. Girl number three. <laughs> this girl had big dreams. She had come from a terrible background. She had high aspirations um, and met, so she thought, the man of her dreams. He had it all. That is everything a girl ever wants. A home, good income, parents who loved her, and an inheritance. They married. Things went well for a time. But then he got sick, and slowly, he had seemed to go, um, all he had seemed to go away, beginning with the career. The expensive home, the benefits, everything. She was forced into the workplace to help sustain the family. She had a hard time because she was poorly treated in the workplace. Day after day, she dreaded going to work. Day after day, her husband dreaded staying home. Things hadn't changed much for many, many years until one day, most of the family resources were gone. The man loved his wife for helping so much, and although he tried to make ends meet, God opened no doors for him. Actually, he seemed to close them. One day after many, many years, she left. She had the same desires and the goals of her husband, but saw him as a hindrance to what she wanted. When he asked her what he did, uh, what he did, she replied, you've been a great father to me. You were all my dad never was. You did all the right things. I just don't want you. Now it's time to go find romance. Girl number three. Now he who received the seed among the thorns is he who hears the word. And the cares of this world and deceitfulness of riches choke out the word. And he becomes unfruitful. See, this was a situation where this woman apparently had it made. She had expectations. When she got married, she thought she was going to be wealthy. She thought her dreams were going to come true. She thought she would get to keep the big house on the hill. You know, she thought she'd have the nice car, the benefits, and like I said, the inheritance. But one day things changed drastically, and he couldn't work anymore, and it all went away. And all of a sudden, her expectations weren't met. He loved her so much that he gave everything that he had for her, despite their situation. See, because he once was wealthy, it was nothing for him to give her all that he had. It was nothing for him to help her get ahead in this world. It was nothing for him to, to help her establish herself and get her involved in business. So he took what little he had left or what, you know, the rest of what remained after living on it for years. And he opened up a business for her. And she's thriving. But when she left and she told him, I don't want you, she took everything else he had and left him with nothing. And he had to start life all over again with almost a big zero. And it hasn't been easy for him. And you know what? Undoubtedly, it hasn't been easy for her because she did go chase that dream. She does hang out with the wealthy. The men she goes out with now have private jet planes that cost millions. Houses on the lake, houses at the ocean. And when they want to go somewhere for New Year's Eve, hey, would you like to hop in my jet and fly to New York City and watch the thing drop? And then we'll fly right back home. See, these are the people. Oh, see, because she runs with the right crowd. See, her, her friends do drive the Ferraris and the Bentleys and Lamborghinis. And she's not a happy woman because the one thing she had was love. And she turned her back on the God that she once served to attain that. And unfortunately, she's involved in some legal issues right now that she stands to win millions of dollars and probably will. But the concern at this point for her is, is that going to cost her her soul? 
See, we don't think about that stuff. See, because here was a woman who had expectations. Here was a woman whose father never took care of her, who treated her differently than the rest, than her sisters. Her sisters all got cars. Her sisters all got to go to college. Her brother got whatever he wanted, but she was never given those things. She had to work for them. And the whole time that she was married to this man, she felt that she still had to work and work and work and work to prove herself. And she didn't have to work because this man gave her all that he had. And it would have changed had she stuck around. Now, let me tell you the kicker of all three stories. When I moved to Tennessee, guys, I was that man. I come from an affluent family. I had anything I wanted. I lived in a million dollar house. I had a great career. I married my wife. I adopted my daughter, her daughter. And I gave everything I had. See, but when God moved me from Tennessee, I mean, to Tennessee from California, he taught me a very important lesson. He taught me that my life was going to mimic the life of Jesus Christ, who came from heaven, who had everything to come to this planet to a place that was desolate like where I live. Oh, it's pretty to look at with the green and all that, the trees, the blue skies. I got smog out in California and it's hot and deserty. But the affluence is there, the wealth is there, and anything I ever wanted was there. The prestige, everything. But when God allowed me to become afflicted and have sickness, it went away. And I had to learn what it was like to live and trust God. You know, to go from being millionaire to almost welfare. And it wasn't, and it still isn't easy. See, my wife liked living in Chino Hills, California. She liked the nice house, you know, and she didn't expect, nor did I expect, the situation we'd end up in. But you know, the situation is this. Did my wife ever become my wife? Was my daughter, because that girl who's living in poverty with a bunch of crackheads right now is my daughter. And it breaks my heart. Because I adopted that little girl just like Jesus adopted me and brought her into my world. See, I didn't tell you one thing. The girl, the first girl I talked about was a girl that when my father was dying three years ago, I hired her to take care of my dying father, the girl who always wanted to be a princess. And I reached out to her with the word of God and wanted to bring her out of the pit and I had the ability to do it and she wouldn't go. And her end will be destruction. And guess what? It didn't end well for me. Not that I had feelings for her because my wife was gone by this time. But the thing is, it's like all I wanted her to do was get saved and be free. And I had the ability and the friends and the people who would help her out. She didn't want that freedom because her sin and the hardness of her heart and her sexual stuff was more important to her than being free. You know, and eventually I don't talk to her anymore. That relationship ended, that friendship ended. I couldn't continue in it. See, because God does not take joy, like I said in the beginning, in the death of the wicked. And I love that girl. She became somebody very special because I really cared and because she needed the love and she got it the right way. Even though I haven't seen her and talked to her in a long time, the love doesn't change. The hurt is there 
And that's what God showed me. Bob, I hurt over people who won't receive me. I truly hurt over people who don't want me. The love doesn't change. The second girl, my daughter, the love doesn't change no matter how she's living. It doesn't change. I still love her. I hate how she's living. I hate the people she's with. I don't hate the people people, but I hate what they're doing, the drugs and all the crazy stuff. I've had to watch my daughter get beaten and beaten by people and homeless, poverty, not being able to keep the lights on, wandering from house to house with a year and a half old baby and not wanting to come home. You can come home and I've shared with her like the prodigal, the door is open to you. I love you. I'm your dad. But I can't have you bring your sin in my house. When we come to Christ, guys, we have to come as we are. He cleans us up. But we can't bring our sin with us. He has to do away with it. I can't have my daughter have guys in my house and do what they do. I can't have drugs in my house. But I want my daughter in my house. I want her more than anything. She's the only family I have. But she refuses to come because she'll have to clean up. And she doesn't want to. You know, my ex-wife, she's miserable. You know, like I said, she works and works and works and works and works. You know what? God had blessed me financially so much she never had to work a day in her life. That was a choice. She chose to work. We come to Christ. The only thing God, that God tells us to strive to do is to enter into the rest. You know, it's hard to rest. We have to work really hard at resting. But we don't have to work very hard at doing it because it's in our nature to get up and do stuff. Well, the bottom line is this. You know, it's like, there's one thing I didn't tell you, and I will. My father died three years ago. I'm the heir to his estate, although I don't have it yet. That would have taken care of any of these people. That's how Jesus is. When we come to Christ, all that God has, he gives to us. He makes everything known to us. See, so many people, guys, want to come to Christ for what they can get. Oh, I'm sick. God will heal me. I'm poor. God will give me, put food on my table. I'm this, I'm that. But how many of us really want to come to Christ just for the sake of knowing him? See, that's a lesson that I had to learn. And I didn't learn it until everything went away, until he removed everything from me and got rid of all the distractions. And the thing is, guys, that this teaching still has a fourth person. There's another person there, the one with the right heart. See, my ex-wife, she already had everything that was my family's. My daughter had the inheritance. You know, if the first girl would have wanted to be, you know, with me and get saved, she could have had it too. All God wants from us is to love him. So many people want to think they're with God or want because of what they can get or that they're going to have a good life. But in reality, guys, he just wants our love. See, giving us the kingdom, taking care of this, us, our needs, that's a given. That is a given. He wants to give us the kingdom. The Bible says it's his good pleasure to give us the kingdom. He wants us to have it. He doesn't want to withhold anything from us. Well, there's always a time for it, a time and a place that he'll take care of us and meet the need. But he loves us and he wants to open up his world to us. See, I want to get remarried more than anything. I love being married. 
And the thing that I desire, because I've met many women in the last three years since my wife left and the divorce was final. The one thing I want is just somebody to love me. No expectations. You know, like obviously my wife had expectations. I just want to be loved for who I am. I don't want to be judged for what I'm not or... You know, how many times do things go wrong in our lives or trials happen? Oh God, you're just this and you're that. And in reality, he's not any of that stuff. That's our perception. Well, my wife used to think things about me that weren't true all the time. I want somebody to see me for who I am. And the thing is, guys, that's how God is. It's his good pleasure to give us the kingdom. When I get remarried, if God chooses to bring me somebody else, to bring me a bride, I just want to spend time with her. I just want to have her come alongside and work together and serve God together. And that's really what God has for us. He just wants us to spend time with him. He just wants us to love him. It ain't about what we can get from him. He'll give it to us. It's a given again. He'll give us what we need. He'll take care of us. He promises that. We walk with him. He will give us the kingdom. Someday when I get my family's stuff, <laughs> I'll be honest with you, there's nothing I wouldn't withhold from my wife, the one who loves me. I want her to have it. I don't care. It's hers. And that's how Jesus is with us. <laughs> He wants us to have it. But in order to have it, he wants us to have him. And I've grown through the hardships to know that I don't care about the stuff anymore. Yeah, I got needs, but I don't care about those things that I once did. I'm sure that when I met Pastor John, he thought I was the biggest pain in the butt that ever walked because back then I was still in my California mode really heavily as a matter of fact. You know, all the cool stuff, the cars, the houses, and everything else. Yo, man, you know. And after, after years of brokenness, that goes away, and those things just don't matter anymore. But the one thing, guys, that does matter is Jesus. He's the only thing that's going to last. He's the only thing that's going to stay. When everything else goes away, trust me, it's all gone. It's all gone. You know but I still got him. And I get frustrated, believe me. God, can I just move back to the beach? <laughs> you know, I get frustrated. It's hard. It's supposed to be hard. He says it's going to be hard. You know, but guess what? It's worth it. But he who received the seed on good ground is he that hears the word and understands it. He who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. If we grab a hold of Jesus for who he is, love him for who he is, accept him for who he is, not who we perceive him to be, because we do, we perceive him to be a certain way, oftentimes. If we perceive him to, I mean, if we receive him for who he truly is, we're going to produce fruit, guys. We're going to produce fruit. And it's going to grow. And sometimes that growth, more often than not, comes through pain and a lot of suffering. And I'm not saying that you guys are going to go through the stuff that I went through. It doesn't have to be to that extreme. But the bottom line is, anytime we move forward, we're coming against our comfort zone and the very things that hold us back in life. When we're comfortable, we don't move forward. So God removes the comfort to push us the direction he wants us to go. And if we don't want to go, he just waits. The problem is, is like I, I'm, I'm greedy enough to want to be in the promised land now. I don't want to have to waste any more time. I don't want to waste any more time in my walk with God because I've wasted quite a bit chasing the things I didn't need to chase. So anyway, guys, I guess I'm done. 
You know, I just gave you my heart. I, I gave you my broken heart. Something I don't really want to do and let people into my business, but that's what God had me to do today. And I just want you to understand that God does not hate those that go to hell. He loves them. One last point, and I'll close. All those things I just shared with you are very painful. But the thing is, guys, I can't sit and think about that which I don't have because Jesus says in his word, for the joy that was set before him, he endured, he endured the cross, he despised the shame, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father. See, someday he's going to redeem his bride to himself, like I want to do if I get one. He's going to redeem us to himself. And those people that didn't want him, although it hurt him, his focus is not what he doesn't have, it's who he does have, which is you and I. So for the joy that was set before him, he endured that cross. Someday God will bless me, hopefully. If he does, that other stuff is gonna go away. I can't worry about the ones that didn't wanna come. And it's the same for Christ and us. So he's looking forward to uniting with you and me. He's looking forward to having a closeness with us. He's looking forward to the day when he calls us home, whether it's here, there, or in the air, through the rapture or through, through dying and going to be with him that way. But he wants his bride. He loves his bride. He cares for his bride. But at the same time, guys, he's purifying his bride too for the day that he calls us home. So understand that. I'm thankful to be here with you today. I love you. You do mean a lot to me, even those I don't know, because of the type of people you've always been to me. And I thank you for that. Father, I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that anything I would have said today <laughs> 